Coming to you from beautiful British Columbia, it's Earth, We Can Do This, with host Paul W. Slusher. Well, hello there. So, have I got a really cool podcast for you today. You know, they, you've heard the saying, uh, you know, think global, act local. Well, this is what this particular uh, podcast is all about. Um, So let me get right into the beef of what we're going to do here. Um, And before I get into who the sponsor is, let me tell you what this show is is really going to do here. So we've in this podcast and and this previous podcast and in future podcasts, we're going to talk a lot about the world. We do that a lot about about how the world needs help, how we can work together, how can we make things better, et cetera, and so on. But, you know, it's not very often that we get an opportunity to talk about local, a local case study, a local situation in which we can actually see how things work, see what the problems are, and maybe find some solutions. Now, you might be going, oh, I'm going to tune this out. No, 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 no. Don't tune this one out. Because what you don't know is that your city council, your mayor's office, your local governments around you, the smaller ones, the real tiny ones that are right around you, are the most easily manipulated ones of all. You know, we, we a lot of us got freaked out Trump he probably had help from the Russians and all this stuff that happened with Trump, you know, on this macro level. And it's terrible. But you know that there are little versions of this going on in little cities and little towns all over the place. And that's what this case study today is about. I've got a really good interview with a local activist who's been working on something like this. I've got somebody from Elections BC, which is British Columbia, talking about some of the rules there. And I'm going to get into this with you as well, because I've got some, I'm going to drop a few bombs here. It's pretty heavy. And the case study is all about the little city of New Westminster, BC. Now, New Westminster, BC is a great city. It really is. It's a cool city. I moved here 10 years ago. I love it here. But there are some serious issues. Well, there's one particular issue that we find very troubling. When I say we, I mean myself and a number of citizens, and it's pretty serious. Um, So let me briefly just mention the sponsor. This show is brought to you, this entire podcast is brought to you by contactsforless.ca, the online contact lens seller that uh, actually gives away 51% of its net profits. Nobody does this. Nobody gives away 51% of its net profits to the nonprofit or charity that you choose. You choose it. And not like when you go in the grocery store and uh, people are going to be like, hey, you want to donate a dollar to this or that? No, no, no. This is not what Context for Less is all about. It's a completely different principle and concept. I'm Paul W. Susher, owner, founder, and CEO. I built the site. I've got a wonderful team uh, helping me run the site. Uh, And so if you're buying contact lenses, that's all we sell. We don't sell glasses. We don't sell... And because it's about eco footprint stuff, you know, probably 10,000 pairs of contact lenses, uh, those con- you put those together to, to make one set of lenses and glasses. So we're all about the contact lenses. That's why it's contactsforless.ca. Okay, so if you're buying contact lenses in Canada, anywhere in Canada, go there, buy your contact lenses there. I promise you, you'll be happy. Prices are amazing. We give away our money. We educate on Facebook and all of the different social medias. And we're really an activist type of company. We're all about trying to save the planet. We're helping you do it. You're helping us do it. So let's get back to what the show is about. This show is about little New Westminster, BC, but it's an, it's kind of an example. It's a case study in what can happen in a city. Okay. Now let me start off by saying, what, what is the actual problem here? Okay. Well, let me tell you, uh, in New Westminster, we have a number of city councilmen, uh, council people, excuse me. All right. And these individual people receive a lot of money in donations to run for office and win. Okay. And we go into this with Brandon. Brandon really covers this. This interview is coming up in a second and you're going to really want to stay tuned for this. But what is the principle we're dealing with here? We're dealing with a city that, you know, nobody's nobody's indicting these counselors. Uh, You know, they're probably all fine people. Uh, But I personally have spoken to every single one of them except one in this particular city and this particular city council. And not one of them deviates from one basic idea. We must increase density. We must create high density zones. We must add 10, 20, 15 to 20, whatever, plus 1,000 people to the city. We must create way more housing. So there's this growth principle. It's this assumption that we must grow. We must grow. We must grow. We must grow at all costs. But, But wait a second. Hold on. Who donates money to the council? Let's just take a look at that. 
Brandon and I go into that in great detail, but it's, it's, it's pretty amazing when you look at who donates money. I would say 70% or more of the money that goes to each one of these counselors is either from uh, um, uh, public unions, uh, unions that have employees that work for the city or have something to do with the city or have something to do with the development of the city. And even more damning are groups like BOSA Properties. And um, oh gosh, who else we got here? We've got all sorts of developers, West Group, uh, and all these various developer uh, uh, companies that either develop properties in the Westminster or have an interest in it. Uh, some run construction, West Group, Port Royal Village Development, all these various people. Why are they doing that? Why are they pushing? Why? Well, follow the money, folks. Follow the money. So here we go. The, first, I'm just going to play the clip from uh from uh we had a real i had a really good talk with a wonderful guy named greg at bc elections uh, elections bc and he has got some information for you so check him out hear what he has to say and then i'll on the back end i'll comment does that mean for example for new westminster city council does that mean that only individuals who are new westminster citizens or residents that is can donate to the city council candidates or any individual in bc can uh, yeah, it's uh, the the latter. Any individual in BC. Wow. So somebody. Wow. Yeah. So any some, any any eligible individual. So yeah. yeah. So, that so means basically, that, the rule oh, the rule ahead. is that um, like for, for for example, let let's just pretend that you were running for for council right now, yep. just for the example's sake. Um, you could collect, um, and you were going to run as an unendorsed candidate. You could collect twelve hundred dollars from every eligible individual in BC. And you could yourself, you could provide twenty four hundred dollars to your campaign. That would be the kind of the maximum amount that could be collected, you know, technically. So can I ask you just I don't know if this is an opinion issue or I don't mean you may not have a position on this, but I, I just have to ask. So it mm -hmm. seems to me counterintuitive, but maybe I'm maybe I'm missing something that an individual in Vancouver who's wealthy and has a particular interest in developing New Westminster, but he doesn't live there. For example, let's say I'm uh, I represent a developer. I build towers, and I want these towers built in New Westminster. Uh, but I don't live there. I have no nothing really. I have no stock in New Westminster. Um, my children go to school there. Nothing. I just build buildings all around. I could literally donate money as an individual to all the different count city council people and say, "Hey, I really want to build a building in you know your city, or I want to build a series of them," and I can donate. Uh, my twelve hundred dollars to every single candidate. Let's say I've got you know a slew of candidates. I can talk to them all, find out who's my friend and who's not, and donate that money uh, to each one of them. And I don't have to have any connection to the city. I can just find zones I want to influence, and I can donate to them. I mean, theoretically, correct? Um, yeah, without getting into right or wrong kind of stuff. I yep. mean, we're not the, the policy body that decides. We just administer it. Yep. But um, yep. but on a technical basis, yes. Um, and any individual that lives in BC can contribute to any candidate that's running for office in BC if they're an eligible individual. Wow. And you can contribute a maximum of $1,200 um, per year per campaign. And so um, each individual who is running for council is a separate campaign. So, okay, so what, what is he saying here? What, what is actually uh, Greg telling us? Greg is telling us that essentially, and he confirms it in the audio, that a rich person, a rich developer, for example, let's say I'm Bob, I build buildings for a living. In fact, every time I put up a 30-story building, I make 10, 15, 20 million dollars in profit, okay? Now, it's in my interest, obviously, for every city that I want to develop a building in, for those city council people to like me, to want to go along with me, and to sort of, you know, go along with my trip, you know, help me build these buildings. What I need you to approve my projects. I need you to uh, work with me so I can make my money. That's what this is about, right? So how can I do that? Well, we all know that donating money, why, why would developers donate money to city council? Just think about it. Why would they do it? Why would an individual city councilman receive seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve thousand dollars from companies that develop or unions that support the workers that work either in the city or for the development projects? Why would they do that? 
It's because they're just really nice people. They just, hey, I want you to have $12,000. Please, I want all of you on the city council each to have $1,200, okay? And that's seven of you, so that's, what is that? You know, what is it, over 84,000 or 8,400, I mean, $1,000. And I'm gonna get my friends here who also develop. We're gonna also give you $84,000 each, you know, each to, to the whole council, one per person. And we're just gonna keep giving you money because we just love you so much. Come on. <laughs> we know that's not the case. Money talks, bleep walks, right? That's the that's the deal. So so what we're going to talk about here now is Brandon and I get into it. Brandon, I'm going to give you the kind of the primer on what Brandon is all about. Brandon came to me uh, a while back because he and a group of people, about 140 of them, signed a petition to try to stop the development of a building in New Westminster. A couple of things Brendan brings up, and he goes into detail here, is Brendan brings up the idea that the city didn't give proper notice, they didn't give proper notice to the residents in the area. The developer didn't give proper notice to the people in the area. Uh, now, did they do that on purpose? Hmm, they chalk it up as an accident. Okay, well, it's a convenient accident. Then, when the opposition begins, what does the city council do? They delay the project until after when? The 2018 elections. That's right. So they've put the project off to the side until after October 2018 when the city of New Westminster has its elections. Now, is all of this a conspiracy? Eh, I don't. For A, I don't think they're smart enough to do that. B, I doubt it. I don't think there's, you know, it's like too many animals, too many snakes on a hydra. I don't think they can all cooperate. You know, conspiracy are really tough to do. But is it a conspiracy in the sense that everybody has the same agenda and they're going to all kind of quietly ag agree and cooperate? maybe, maybe, I don't know. So I'm going to jump right in. Here's the interview with Brendan. It's a, it's a good chunk of information. You're going to get a lot out of it. On the back end of that, I'm going to close with my thoughts. Um, but here's my interview with Brendan. Enjoy. Okay, folks, so we are on the phone now with Brendan. Brendan's a resident of New Westminster. Brendan and I connected a while back uh, over the concern over a particular building uh, that's going to be going up in New Westminster. So uh, in my call with Brendan, uh, we're going to touch on a few things. Um, the first thing Brendan uh, Brendan's going to sort of touch on is, is sort of his petition and the resistance to this building that he feels and he feels the other residents have. And then we might break into a, a, a larger conversation about where this all stands in terms of the city council and democracy and, you know, really like what this is about for us as residents. I'm a resident. He's a resident. Um, but let's get straight to it. So, Brendan. Hi, Brendan, by the way. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. So happy to be here. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. And Brendan's a great guy. I have really enjoyed getting to know him um, over the last few weeks. Brendan uh, started a petition. So maybe I'll just back off and say, hey, so why don't you tell me a little bit about what you started, what you did, and why you started it. And I might jump in with a question or two, but maybe you give me an overview of, of how we got to this place. Yeah, sure. No problem. So, um, yeah, it, it actually kind of took me by surprise. I moved in here a couple of years ago. Uh, we... Uh, liked the neighborhood and had heard that it's uh, pretty stable. Anyway, um, I saw a news article, um, I guess it would have been last summer-ish, uh, just one article, couldn't find any more info about this tower going up just down the street, and I was looking into it, couldn't get much info, which probably we'll talk about a bit more later. But anyway, um, wasn't too happy about it. There's a lot of particular concerns that I'll get into uh, in a bit here. But uh, I'm not alone with that. So there was a bunch of people in my building. Uh, I'm on my strata council, and so I'm often hearing concerns from people who live here. And I haven't heard really anyone come out and support. Everyone in the building has been against it. And so I thought, you know what, I, I can probably do what I can with my power to try and stop this, or at the very least, you know, give the input of the residents who live here. And I was especially motivated to do this because... Um, the city of New Westminster recently adopted a new official community plan, a kind of comprehensive document that details how they want the city to grow and look uh, over the next, you know, decades, essentially. They only do it every, uh, I think the last one was over 10 years ago, but I'm not 100% sure. Anyway, while they were doing that, they had planned to put a block away from this tower, a, 
uh, townhouse zoning, which is currently for single family uh, homes. And anyway, the residents on that street were not taking that. They put up uh, signs on their lawn and they called City Hall and said, you know, we live here. We love this neighborhood. We don't want it to change. We don't want townhouses. We like the houses here. And uh, sure enough, the city said, okay, well, you guys are the ones who live here. Okay, we're going to leave it. And so the OCP came out uh, last fall and it had removed what the city wanted to do, which was put up townhouses there. And I thought, well, if they can do it. Uh, you know, it's worth a shot. So I gathered up some signatures. I got 70 signatures. And uh, I mean, it's a pretty thorough uh, sort of argument on the petition here I have. Uh, and it's mainly attacking various points of that OCP that uh, say they'll take into consideration things like views of the towers nearby, shadowing. Um, they will do their best to make comprehensive neighborhoods that have a type of home for everyone and so anyway I broke that down and went through the whole document and I you know said well this policy says you're going to take into account the neighboring towers views and well that felt fine and good but as it's come down the pipe your view analysis I'm one of the neighboring towers our tower isn't even part of that view analysis uh, some of the other ones are. I disagree with the way it's conducted. Um, anyway, um, there's that concern. There's the concern that really within my apartment, I can see 10 high-rise buildings all within a two-block radius. Um, I can also walk, like I said, a block away to Fifth Street here, and it's all single-family homes, essentially, for another 10 blocks until you reach another commercial node with a couple of towers there. And it's the same way west, east, and north of me, essentially, just a bunch of towers right here and then a bunch of houses. We've heard, if you read a lot of the social media out there, that New West is in dire need of townhomes. The city is not really doing much with that, though. So I have on my petition, you guys are saying comprehensive and yet really you're just cramming more and more towers to have come up in the, within the past 10 years around here and residents have been complaining that they were under the understanding there's no more towers coming to uptown. It's, you know, a relatively suburban neighborhood, even though it is pretty urban walking around, but the train is a 20 minute walk up a very, or down a steep hill to get home. It's very steep. Most people don't walk it. Um, it, it's a very car oriented and, you know, quiet neighborhood in a lot of ways, yet we're cramming towers in like it's downtown Vancouver. And that was one of the things actually the developer told me at uh, a meeting he, I attended when I made the complaint. He said, well, you know, lots of people are living happily in towers in downtown Vancouver, which I pointed out, but I chose not to live downtown Vancouver <laughs> because I don't want that hyper density. New West is a nice balance and that's, kind of the refrain I've heard from residents throughout this process. Hmm. Um, hmm. Okay. So anyway, yeah, I okay. got so can this I, can I jump in with a quick question? In. So you, brought, you said something about townhomes. Can I just jump on on this? So you said that they referred to that there was a need for townhomes. Now, was that a report? What, 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 what if, where do you, where does that information come from? Right. Well, here, actually, I can pull it up pretty quickly. It's in the Metro Vancouver regional context oh, statement, it. which there we go. And so that informed the way we, the city drafted their OCP. They kind of have to follow these guidelines that Metro Vancouver, the overarching political uh, entity of the lower mainland in Vancouver area, they set out certain guidelines to follow. And it, it uh, goal four, develop complete communities, which is supporting affordable and diverse housing Strategy 4.1, provide diverse and affordable housing choices. Policy 8.4, create neighborhoods with housing options for people of all ages, abilities, and household types to meet their changing needs. And yet, this tower is going to bring more of the same. It's also going to bring not affordable housing. This is the thing a lot of people, like I had my neighbor, for example, she said, well, I don't know if I want to sign your petition, Brendan. It's rentals. And on the one hand, I, I completely understand her concern. No one wants to deny anyone a rental home. But the thing to keep in mind with this is these rentals are not going to be some sub-market affordable housing. It's going to be 
essentially luxury condos. These buildings are extremely expensive to build in Vancouver right now. And the rent in there is not going to be cheap. <laughs> it's going to be very pricey. Same with the condos that are going to go in. It's going to be more of the same, smaller units, larger prices. And so the argument that the city has made and some of the committees and staff I've talked to is that we need this tower. We need more affordable housing. We're in the middle of a housing crisis and it's got to happen because people are getting kicked out of their homes, blah, blah, blah. But I take issue with that. And I don't think that building top end units is really going to help what we need right now, which is the people I've met on the street this past week looking for an apartment for my mother-in-law. There's 10 people or more at one viewing and they're fighting to fill out applications and they bring them cash to give the landlords because their rent for a bachelor suite is going up 300 bucks a month or their one bedroom for $2,000 in new Westminster. It's so, so let me it, ask you about I that then. I totally so, am on board. No, absolutely. So, for, absolutely. I just want to say I'm on board for affordable housing, but yeah, please go. No, no, that's good. And that's a great point because one of the issues for the Facebook page that we have up now, a lot of the comments is that we're that dispositions of this Facebook group, uh, which is uh, New Westminster Citizens Against Overdevelopment, has led to massive intensity about the rent issue, uh, that you're against renters, you're against renters. But that's not the position, is it? Because we're not really solving that problem there. But let me let me jump into another part of that. So has there been any discussion in this project that they would do rent control uh, or anything that, to really mitigate that problem? Or, or is that, or is that just, because I'm not even sure they can do rent control. I'm not sure that's even legal, but what, have you, have you read anything or heard anything about this project attempting to implement rent control? I have not. And actually that's probably a good question for me to bring up in the ongoing time. Uh, my understanding is it will be market rental. Um, sure. so it's not going to be subsidized, not going to be, uh, you know, affordable housing. It's just going to be, you know, whatever the market demands. And we all know that the market here demands a very high price. Well, you know, the way it works in so. BC, from what I understand, is that there is a limit to the amount you can increase rent per year. And I think it's 4% or something like that. And so, but that doesn't dictate what the starting rent is. So if I decide to start the exactly. rent at $3,000 a month, then yeah, I can increase it 4%, but I started it at 3000 a month. So um, it gives me the right to do whatever I want as a starting rent. But once I've started the rent, then I then I am stuck with it. That, and which brings up another point, which is that based on what you were saying, if they do build a building like this and more buildings like this in the city of New Westminster, what you're going to see is you're going to see a lot of people renting their condos or buying these condos out, then renting them if they can, based on the strata, renting them and starting the price as high as possible. Why? Because they don't want to start at a low rate and only get to increase that rent every 4% every year. They're going to want to have a starting high point. And with the demand as high as it is, these rents are going to be huge. It's actually, they're going to be higher than a mortgage would be. So, you know, you follow mm -hmm. me? So at the end of the day, yeah, we're not really solving any sort of uh, rent issues for people that are middle income or lower middle income. Okay. One of the, one of the, yeah, here. I completely agree. And I actually just want to throw out one quick point about uh, housing in BC on that point. Uh, the last apartment before I moved into this condo that I lived in, there's a nice little loophole, you know, uh, when you're talking about starting rent, and how people can't raise it over a certain amount. That's true under most circumstances. However, the Tenancy Act does allow for a landlord to sign you up on what's called a fixed term lease. So normally when you rent an apartment, you rent for a year and it goes month to month. However, a landlord can, and with a, a vacancy rate as low, it is, as low as it is, you just sign whatever you can get. They can say, you're going to sign up for one year. After that year, you can renew or you can leave, but we're not going month to month. And after that year expires, they can jack your rent up however much they want because it's not a rent increase on you because you're signing a new lease. Ah, so it's right. a, technically a new tenant. <laughs> and this is going on all the time. Well, so, I mean, there's well. sneaky ways that these landlords can make it really bad for your tenants. Anyway, please continue. Oh, no, that's brilliant. Thank you. This is beautiful, <laughs> yeah. Brandon. You're doing a great job. Okay, so now we want to get to something else. So uh, in a meeting that Brandon and I had with another party we won't name because she's not a party to this call, um, she brought up a very interesting concern, and I think you may be familiar with this, so I want to touch on this with you, that this particular individual said to us that the city of New Westminster actually, uh, by the rules of uh, bylaws, are required to give notice within, was it 300 feet? Uh, am I right? 
Yeah, I think it might be two or three hundred meters. It's, two, that's but right. definitely any neighboring buildings. For right. sure. And and that notice did not come. Not only did it not come on time, if I understand correctly, correct me if I'm wrong. But when that individual mm-hmm. contacted the city, not only did they blame it on clerical error, but then they didn't really solve the problem right away. She actually had to take extra steps to receive that notification. Am I correct or is that incorrect? I believe that is uh, the way it happened. Um, so they had what's called an advisory planning commission meeting at the city, um, open to all residents um, and advertised only well, in the papers, but they send out door-to-door notices to every uh, resident, I believe even every business owner, uh, within, like we said, that couple hundred meters. And it has to be out within, I think, one week, maybe two, uh, before the meeting date. And, of course, that's so if you want to prep a statement, if you want to organize people, uh, or if you need to book time off work, that you have the time to do that. Um Unfortunately for the building nearby, they did not get this notice and it came out at the end, I think, like within 48 hours of the meeting after uh, one of the residents that we, you're telling us about had called and said, hey, this didn't come in. Yeah. Thankfully, she's friends with one of the residents in my building and we did get the notices. And uh, yeah, the city had just said, well, this computer clerical problem, whatever, and Story. We'll try to fix it. Um, frankly, I think the more professional and more appropriate action would have been to delay the meeting, seeing as how they already knew that we had uh, 140 petition signatures against this, and yet half of those petitioners don't even know about the meeting until a day or two before. Um, mm-hmm. So I didn't feel like that process was very fair, as she did, obviously. And that's that, not even the worst of it, is that they didn't get that notice for the city organized um, commission. There was a open house held by the developer a couple months, I think, before that. That notice did not go to this building at all. They are the closest neighbor to the proposed development, and they did not get the notices for this open house. We did, and that's good, but these are the most impacted people, and they didn't get notice for two in my opinion, very important meeting. Yeah, and for the so record, it, the, it has been an issue. Yeah, and for the record, the, the name of that developer is Or Development. <laughs> I'm just going to get them off. That's there. correct. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, okay, so let's uh, let's. That, this is really quite interesting because what this speaks to to me, and I'm now I'm looking at uh, a, 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 a a list of donations that were given to various city council people now. They do in 2014. The ones that are currently on the city council. Um, this is not. This is a, not a full complete list. But I, I want to bring this up because, mm-hmm. and maybe you can speak to this on your own. But I want to take a minute to touch on this and then get your reaction. What's so interesting to sure. me is I'll look at you know individual people like Bill Harper, for example, is one of the councilmen. Okay, he received, and I'll just list some of them. $4,800 from the Canadian Union of Public Employees, $750 from another version of the CUPE, another $625 from another local CUPE, uh, Sumran Construction, $1,000, West Group Properties, $1,000, $1,500 from Port Royal Village Development, again, another developer, Bosa Properties, $750. Um, this is just one guy. And if you go through this, the one yeah. thing that's fascinating is every single person in here received thousands of dollars dollars from unions that deal with people who are going to benefit from development and developers themselves. Um, some of this is even related to, you know, the hospital. They were trying so hard to get the hospital uh, expanded upon. And you see right here, right here with the governor, I'm sorry, with the mayor and others, some of those um, um, unions related to that are donating as well. So it is fascinating. And we and, and you know before we came on the air, uh, Brandon and I were chatting about this. That what is alarming and should be of concern. And the podcast here is all, not about New West; it's about New West as a, as a as a uh, as an example of a, of a problem. But here's a and I want to get. So I have two part question for you when I'm done with my little rant here. Um, is that yeah. clearly there is a potential ability for people with money to, for example, I don't have enough money to influence who's going to win 
uh, all the different seats uh, in British Columbia to to create a coalition government. That would take literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars for me to to influence that. But boy, if I spend five thousand dollars per city, I can affect city councils on levels way above and beyond I can do anywhere else. So it takes less money to influence and buy influence with city councils more than any other political body in Canada. This is true in the United States as well. City councils are, are, you know, you've got less people voting, less people paying attention. Most people just don't care what city council is doing unless it, it's affecting them negatively. So to me, I'm not saying that city council's on the take. I'm not saying that. But it's baffling to me that someone could not make the argument that if I'm receiving $10,000 combined from developers for me to win an election, that somehow that $10,000 is not going to influence how I vote or how I choose to implement policy or how I choose to implement or even interpret a larger growth plan that's handed to me and it's on my desk and I'm reading it. I'm going to be influenced by the people that gave me the most money. And let's be honest, if I'm going to run my my next election, I want those same people supporting me. And before I, by the way, let you jump Jump in. There's been a rule change in British Columbia that disallows now uh, corporations and unions from donating money directly anymore, which I'm glad they did that. But it doesn't really prevent the problem because CEOs and directors of companies can individually donate money and do so in such a way that we can't even. So in a way, this could be worse. Because now at least I can see that West Group Properties, Simran, Bosa Properties, all these guys donated money to influence things. Now it's going to be Bob Jones, Fred Smith, Susan Jackson. I have no idea who these people are and where they come from, but they all may represent the same interests. Any reaction to that? Yeah, well, actually, on that last topic, I just want to say I, I, I disagree that it's necessarily going to be worse. However, I think the potential for a worse environment is certainly there. I mean, if you're talking about a CEO of a large business, they have no problem telling their employees, hey, I'm going to give 1200 bucks. Please donate to this candidate. Candidate, And that please is, you know, if you've worked for a boss in a corporate environment, you understand the way things get done. It's just like in the old days, bosses telling uh, people to vote certain way who work for them. So I definitely yeah. agree that there's danger in this new precedent. Um, and I just wanted to also clarify your point about uh, cash in new westminster specifically i did the math and uh, you know i didn't look into the public employee and unions but that's a that's a very good point i think you brought up that you know the, the staff at city hall are invested in keeping their jobs they want towers to be coming in so that they have work to do and, and you know not saying that they shouldn't have jobs of course but right. i'm just saying there's a bit of conflict of interest there and i haven't even considered that until you brought it up but I did the math, and there's about $40,000 going to the current city council, which, by the way, is all from the same party, all councillors and the mayor. Um, and they took $40,000 from property management companies, from developers, uh, and from commercial landlords. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, you know, I, yeah. I, I'd love to believe that they're angels who can just take money and no, no strings attached, and they'll still, you know, be working for the, the electorate. However... I have to bring in that cynical part of me that's seen every level of government in my entire life take money and <laughs> abuse that privilege. I don't know which ones of them are doing that, and maybe none of them are, but it creates a optics issue that it doesn't look good in my eyes. I don't want my city councillors to be taking that much money from, well, frankly, any business. But when there's a housing crisis in the city and the number one topic in every election right now is housing they shouldn't be taking money from people connected to that industry in my opinion i agree with you and and okay so this is really getting down to the core of what this particular podcast is about today and um you know uh and when when brandon and i are on the phone i'll be doing some other talks i've got some other stuff coming up after this interview that i'm going to uh, discuss uh, but really what at the heart of this for me is I mean, there's a lot of things going on here. Uh, uh, larger metro zones dictating to small jurisdictions as to how they're going to develop. Uh, this this is alarming by of its just in of itself because I mean we're a democracy after all, and somehow uh, there's this sort of patronizing view. A city looks down at the citizens and says, "Look, essentially, yeah, you you can have commentary, but in the end, we know what's best." Um, 
as we're taking money from people who have an interest, you know, it's, it's, it's actually patronizing, insulting on so many different levels. Uh, and then the, you know, and then using the backdrop of other consultants who are not from new Westminster telling us, this is what you need to do. Uh, and then they say, well, now see, we have the backing of this, of this report. So it's kind of, it reminds me of Joe McCarthy in the days of, you know, communist, uh, <laughs> when, when Joe would he'd pick a piece of paper and he'd say, I have the list of a thousand communists in my hand. You know, it, he didn't have any in communists in his hand. He just used that as a, as a backdrop to rationalize what he was doing. So it feels like the city has yeah. this tendency as well. Now, again, these city councilmen aren't necessarily, these councilors are not bad people per se. Um, I personally met, I spoke with every single one of them except Jamie McAvoy and I, and, and and Patrick Johnston actually met with me in person and thank thank him for that. Um, but, you know, again, mm -hmm. Mr. Johnston was a big defender of high density zones. And when I challenged him on Facebook about the donations, he actually got very defensive and said, what do you think I'm on the take? My response was, no, I don't think that. But I think it's ludicrous for us to assume that your thousand dollar West Group donation, West Group properties donated to you and and Bosa properties gave you 750 and and the CUPE gave you a combined of what, 3200 or something. Don't I, I just can't imagine that that seven thousand dollars that helped you get elected did not influence how you saw this issue. And and or or maybe it goes the other way. Maybe it's a chicken and the egg thing. Maybe it's not about that they got influenced. It's more that, well, Patrick's going to be the guy they're going to give money to because they know Patrick stands on these issues in this way. So, you know, the, the unions and the property management and the everybody who's got an interest in development are going to say, you know what, we need to find a guy who's going to represent our needs. Uh, it's not about what the city wants. It's about what I want. I need to develop, etc. And of course, the story, like Joe McCarthy, I've got this report in my hand. Uh, I have a, a rationalization for my behavior. So it's it, it may be more about that Patrick's just the guy that filled the bill. And and then they were able to put that money into him and, and accomplish what they needed. Any any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I, that, that's a big one. Um... So I'm not sure specifically how to comment on that. I mean, my experiences with, with the city council, I've met a couple of them have been relatively positive, but you know, I, I am on the same page with you that, uh, you know, we don't really, we, we don't know the inner workings of the city council or what each councilor is thinking. So it, sure. it creates a challenge and, and, and it doesn't really, well, here, I'll tie this into my experience at the uh, Advisory Planning Commission. That, by the way, that was going to be my uh, next meeting. question. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Is okay. what, How do you feel that this was going to, we'll kind of end our interview on this part, but I think this is important. How has the city responded mm -hmm. to both the petition and your inquiries? How have you felt that they've handled it? Exactly. So that's what I was going to bring up. At this Planning Commission, that was uh, the most formalized um, response to the concerns of my building and the other building right next door to the proposed development that didn't get those notices. Uh, we both did petitions, uh, getting about 70 signatures each. Um, and we, I, we'd sent them into the city hall already. Um, and I'd sent them to the planning department and I'd sent emails and spoken personally with the head planner who's looking after this development. And, um, really hadn't gotten anything other than, you know, thanks, bud. All right, we'll look into it. Um, and, you know, I'm not expecting like a, a full fledged response document or anything like that, but it didn't give me the best confidence that my concerns were actually landing on listening ears anyway. So that was basically substantiated when we arrived at the APC meeting, it was a packed room. I mean, I don't go to these meetings very often. Uh, well, sorry, to be completely honest, this is the first time I've been at an APC meeting specifically. But anyway, it was a very full room. And the chair of the council or the commission had told us twice that this was the largest turnout to an APC meeting that he's ever seen. And yet, at this meeting, there was, I don't want to exaggerate, over a dozen speakers of residents mainly nearby the building who just said, you know, this isn't what we want for various reasons, like the ones I've already touched on, some others. Uh, there was, I think, three people in, who came out in favor of it. 
One was affordable housing, and I like to think he's misguided, but maybe he knows something I don't know, and this will make affordable housing. The other two, though, were local business owners and representatives of the, I believe it's Uptown Business Development Area or something like that, some coalition of local businesses. Yeah, familiar. And I I mean, 100%, why wouldn't they want more customers right next door to their businesses? It's plain to see why they would support this. So we had three people in support all attached to organizations, and yet there was over a dozen, I want to say over 20, but I don't want to exaggerate, so just take that with a grain of salt. A lot of people, the room was packed, and we all said, with very, some were very well thought out, maybe some less than others, but regardless, their voices matter. And the whole thing fell on deaf ears, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, at the end of the meeting, they went around the table, and every commissioner told us... Uh, their decision and why and it essentially came down to uh, i you know i i liken it to the way uh bc is being treated right now about the kinder morgan pipeline regardless of how you feel about it mm-hmm. you know there the grow, uh, support for that has been growing but it used to be about 50 50 in the province so the people who are saying we don't want this like the people here in our neighborhood who don't want this tower who say we don't want this and we give out good reasons and we think about it and send out documents and blah 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 and the commission just said, well, we're in the middle of a housing crisis, just like Trudeau is saying, we're in the middle of a, you know, we, we have economic issues. We need the pipeline and we know what's best for you. Interesting. We're just getting this kind of shoved down our throat yeah. by this commission that's saying we're in the middle of a housing crisis. We need it, even though we'd already said what we need is townhouses. What yeah. we need is affordable housing. We don't need top end towers in an area already full of towers. Well, OK. But and you know that what? Was literally that... every commissioner said that. And okay, Every so commissioner. and you know, okay, so then, and these guys, are, and these commissioners are not elected; they're appointed, correct? Correct. Okay, so these guys don't have to be accountable to you. You know, um, it's it's sort of like if I send my henchmen to go beat you up, I didn't beat you up. I sent somebody else to do it. I didn't do it. You know, somebody else punched you <laughs> in the mouth. You know, um, here's another thing that's interesting, by the way, and we'll just this is a good place to end our our call for the podcast. Uh, is that uh, you know the city council has now delayed further hearings on this particular development. And I think one other one, I'm not 100% sure on that other one. There's another one on another part of the city that's been, got a lot of resistance as well. And I believe that that's been delayed. And they both have been delayed post-election. And to me, and I don't know what your feelings are, and I'll let you have the last word on this, it, but to me, that's a no-brainer that this is about you know, essentially, if I want to, you know, be metaphorical, they're looking straight us in the eye like the big brother and saying, you don't have a clue. So I'm going to wait until mom leaves and then I'm going to do whatever I want to do, you know, uh, <laughs> because at the end yeah. of the day, you don't know what you're talking about. You're just some lowly citizen. I am a city council person. I have knowledge you don't have, um, you know, and it's a lot, you know, like anyway, there's a lot of different examples I could give you, but that seems to be the case. And they are dead set on achieving it. You know, uh, Johnston, um, Patrick Johnston said to me, uh, and I quote him on this, he said, this is a done deal. This is happening. You can't stop it. I mean, I, that's a quote he, to me personally. I wrote it down wow. in my notes. And, uh, and, and so I was trying to explain to him, well, what about this resistance? What about that? What if this happened? What if the city felt this way? He just kept coming back to this checks. And he, and another quote, this checks a lot of boxes for us. What that basically says is dad's telling the kids you know, you don't have a voice here, man. It's not, you don't get to choose. Like we've already decided you're going to a reform school, <laughs> you know, or whatever. It yeah, is. yeah. And, and, and that's just the way it is. So you can cry and tell me 20 reasons why going to a reform school is not good for you. You don't want to do it, but we've already made that decision. We're just going to wait until the right time. And when you have the least resistance, and then we're going to implement it on you. Um, and, and, and by the way, just like Joe McCarthy, I have the names of 2000 communist party members in my hand. Uh, they lean on the, the larger Metro planning uh, strategy to say we must. And it's, it's, you know, and, and again, my last comment on this with you and I'll get more into my own broadcast mm-hmm. later is that this feels to me like a narrative. It's like kind of like how, when people say there is only one God, my God, right? It, it's a narrative that yeah. they've created 
they're promoting it, and any alternative, quote unquote, God is offensive on its face. So if you come up to them and say, look, how about if we do this another way? Are you kidding me? No way. This is, there's only one God. Uh, you know, this is what I feel is happening. Um, and I don't know, you, you, I'll give you the final say on this. What, how do you take that, Brandon? Yeah, well, I completely agree that this is a narrative thing that's going on probably across North America. We, we have a very unique kind of urban development strategy in this country, well, in this continent, North America and Canada, I guess Mexico is a little different. But Canada and the United States, we have relatively unique. We're big, spread out, sprawling cities. Uh, dedicated mainly to cars, thanks to Henry Ford's lobbying back in the day. <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, you know, th- that, that's the reality. Um, and there are people who want to change that. And th- I think the thing is, is you have to keep in mind where the facts are coming from. And so, you know, I, again, I'm not trying to call out any specifically city councillors for corruption or anything like that. But here's an interesting stat. 2016 Canadian census says only less than 20% one in five New Westminster residents calls a uh, single family home their residence. Or sorry, that might be actually, there's only 20% of the homes are single family homes. Okay. I'm getting mixed up here. But either, either way, it's a small amount. We're a pretty urban city with a lot of apartments and things like that. Yeah. And yet our city council, I think there's two councillors who don't live in a house. So th- they have a certain uh, outlook, a certain... Uh, way of thinking about how to develop and the way we're planning to develop Vancouver and a lot of the other cities that across the continent is let's build a lot of density right where there is density, where we think it should go, where we can check boxes to make it sound good. And then if we do that, we don't need to touch any of those single family homes, those big boat voters, because you have to keep in mind towers, they're not really the biggest voting block. Those single-family homeowners, you can bet your ass. They've, sorry if I shouldn't be swearing. No, but it's okay. No, they, it's okay. <laughs> they're, they're, they're organized. You know, they, they can go door-to-door, collect signatures, rally. They have their friends on speed dial. Yeah. In towers, I can't even, you know, when I collected those signatures, I had to leave my petition in the lobby. I'm not allowed to door-to-door petition here. Right. I tried to go next door to other buildings. I can't even get contact information for a lot of towers. Right. They're very... The, like a silent majority here, right. but we're getting squashed by the narrative that we need to densify these areas because that's what makes sense. Yes. When mm. my argument is, look at Europe or a lot of other places in the world where they're way denser than we are, way more walkable, bikeable, livable. You can always go to the market or the park with your kid, mm-hmm. and it's a beautiful city to live in. Mm-hmm. They don't have high rises everywhere mm-hmm. because they just said, mm-hmm. you know, we just need a few walk-ups. Mm-hmm. four or five stories mm-hmm. and you can achieve a very nice urban landscape that way mm-hmm. but we have a narrative that we need to squeeze towers in because that's how it works yeah it's you being know ca- fueled by yeah bill, oh, go ahead, bill go harper ahead. one of the counselors actually said to me and i again i quote he said if you want to save housing you need high rises and i was like I, that's a narrative that's a false that's a false equation I, I find that to yes. be a false equation. But again, so the, uh, Brandon, this has been a phenomenal chat. I want to thank you for being um, on uh, Earth. We can do this uh, with us. And, um, you know, we'll have you on again. In fact, we're probably going to bring Brandon on a bunch for a, a number of topics because Brandon just seems to have his act together. Um, and so, Brandon, thanks, <laughs> thanks again for being on the air. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk soon. Thank you, Paul. It's been a blast and looking forward to it again, man. Take care. So there you have it, folks. There's the story of my, well, my conversation with Brandon sort of lays out a, a number of things and we'll just rehash them briefly. So the city doesn't give proper notice to uh, the residents within 300 meters as they're supposed to. Uh, within what, 48 hours before the hearing, they finally get the word out only because some concerned citizens act on it. They claim it's a clerical error. It could be. I think this stuff is pretty important though. Kind of doubt that would be an accident. The developer also doesn't give proper notice. Some people didn't even get notice from the developer for his public hearing. Um, so, you know, now why does this matter to you? If you live somewhere else, if you live, you don't live in New Westminster, maybe you live in the Vancouver metro region. Uh, And there's, by the way, we don't even have the time to go into the whole, you know, whole 
like what do you want to call it the assumption that we must grow we must build more buildings we must build more houses we must increase intense uh density 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 growth 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 housing 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 grow 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 keep adding people keep adding people you know like i could just i could have a whole podcast on how the weakness of that assumption and the city is sort of under a spell of this mentality that hey you know everybody we've got to go along with growth growth come on growth come on everybody you know uh, wait, wait, wait a minute. What about an alternative view? And I'll just sort of comment on this. I actually met with Patrick Johnston and Patrick Johnston gave me, a, he was a very polite guy. He's a very nice guy. He, he gave me two and a half hours of his time and essentially his entire speech and pitch to me was that there was no way you could stop this project. It checks a lot of boxes. This is the way it is. There's nothing you can do. Sorry, buddy. Uh, oh, and by the way, it's good for the city. You know, if you live in a community like New Westminster, you may be faced with a situation where your leaders are talking down to you and saying to you, your position may sound pretty. Thanks for listening. Say, thanks for playing, folks. But eh, you don't win anything. Reason why is because we know better than you. We've already done the research, quote unquote. We've already done our project uh, background stuff. We've got our uh, we've got our mandate from the metro region or from some other party outside of the city. Oh, by the way, a bunch of people who don't live in the city came and told us what we should do because they know best, right? Well, you know, look, I live in a democracy. At least that's I like to believe I live in a democracy. And in a democracy, not only should I have the right to vote vote on things, I think I should not only be, and I not only should I be heard, but I should be treated as if my val- my voice has a value. Uh, you know, and I'm not saying Patrick Johnson didn't do that. He did a very good job of sort of petting me like a kitten, uh, making me feel like I was loved and, and good for him as he's a politician. That's what he does. Um, but did in the end, did it make any difference at all? Did I have any impact on his perspective? Zero, zero, zero. In fact, he and I have interacted on Facebook and he's acted rather defensively. One of the things that I noticed, and I spoke to almost every other city councilman after that, they all parrot the same logic. High density zones are the way to go. They're saving us. One guy named Bill Harper told me, and I quote, and I said this previous in the in the clip you just heard, that in fact, if we want to save the houses in New Westminster, we need to accept these buildings. Really, Bill? It all that almost sounds a little blackmailish, you know. If you want to save your children, you better give me the money. I it just it feels really dirty. So one of the things that I've learned about New Westminster politics is this: that New Westminster is not a is it not is does not is not a dirty city council. These are nice people. I mean, they're very polite, but they're defensive when you call them out. If you challenge them with viewpoints that they don't agree with, they don't like to hear it. Bill Harper in particular wouldn't listen to a word anybody said other than himself. I found him to be one of these guys that just talks down to people maybe as a matter of pa- a practice. But everybody else was pretty cool. But they were also very much on board and were not willing to even entertain the idea that there might be another way. There might be another way, guys. Are you willing to even talk about it? That didn't seem to come up for anyone at any time. And you know, to be honest, I find myself a pretty articulate guy and yet I just couldn't get across to any one of them. In fact, I would straight out ask them, so are you in favor of high density zones? They would say, well, yes, I am. Of course. It's almost like, what am I? Are you in favor of air? Oh, of course I'm in favor of air. You know, it was almost like I was shocking them that I was even asking them. So if you live in New Westminster, there's probably hardly anybody listening who is, But if you are in New Westminster and you're listening to this, you should really think about a couple of things. Think about all the money that's donated to your city council and who's donating that money. Think about what their intention is in doing so. Why are these people giving money to them in this way? What what do you think they're trying to get out of it? Why do you think so many buildings have been thrown up into this in this city in the last 15 years? So many. And of course, why do you think they keep moving around where they're going to put these buildings? Because every time they try to put a building up, everybody in the area freaks out and says, not right here, not in my backyard. And so they move it to another spot and they just keep moving around because they're just trying to find a spot to put these buildings up. And also remember one other thing, follow the money. When developers build buildings that are 30 stories high, you can bet the profit is anywhere between three, four, five, six, seven, 10, 12, 15, 20 million dollars in profit when they're all done. They wouldn't build them. They don't build these buildings for charity, you know? And what do they do with that 12 million dollars or 10 million dollars? They take that money and they run. Do they put it in back into New Westminster? Of course not. Do they do they donate some of it to the city council and the next election? Well, 
you know, yeah, in some form or another, the, the laws have changed a little bit, uh, which we talked about. But you know what? It's still it's still going to end up in the in back helping the same people because they want to keep the ball rolling. So that's my position on things. You know, I I love New Westminster, and at least for now, I'm not going to move. But if New Westminster continues to create an overcrowded, jammed, high density city, widening the road so that even more cars can come flying through here, uh, with no real concern for what we feel as citizens and basically going to just stonewall if we tell them, hey, you know, we're all against this. Well, that's very nice. Thanks for playing. We're going to build it anyway. That's what we see. That's what we're seeing. And I bet you anywhere, any, any where you live, it's possible the same kind of thing is happening. This is not an anti-development position. It's a, I want to live in a city that I like to live in position. I want to be able to live in a place that it take, doesn't take me an hour to drive from one side of the city to the other. I would like to live in a place that's just nothing but car sounds and exhaust. I'd like more green spaces. I'd like to have my schools be quiet places, safe places. I'd like it to be a nice place to live and grow old. And New Westminster is a place I really thought was going to be that. Well, time will tell. October 2018 is the elections. We'll be doing an update on this thing very, very soon. Uh, you know, right, well, in October. And we'll let you know how it turned out. Because, you know, time will tell. Did we make a difference? Did we not? Is it the same old thing? <laughs> Stay tuned. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Thanks for being connected to us. Thanks for paying attention to issues in your community. And have a great day. Earth, We Can Do This has been brought to you by contactsforless.ca, the only online contact lens seller in Canada to give away half of its net profits to help save the planet. So thank you for listening and thank you for supporting contactsforless.ca.